Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bersiki Luka Kutateladze. I promise I will not make you repeat that. Uh, and I'm an associate professor of criminology and criminal justice at Florida International University and an associate director for prosecution and courts in the FIU Center for the Administration of Justice. I'm also the principal investigator who directed this research project. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone and to introduce uh, three very special contributors to the project. First of all, State Attorney Catherine fernandez Randall, whose support was instrumental for making this project happen and for shaping its vision. So I'm so grateful for that, Kathy. Um, we also have uh, Alfredo Ramirez, uh, the director of the Miami-Dade Police Department. And the department has been the primary partner from the police end. While we have a number of great police departments in our jurisdiction, our primary partner was MDPD, uh, but we're also working with a number of other police departments. And uh, last but not least, my dear friend, Orlando Gonzalez, an executive director of SAVE, um, safeguarding American values for everyone. What a great name that is. Um, thank you for your support, everyone, and for being uh, here today. Um, I, I would say the next, uh, I'd like to go through some of the slides, uh, describe the study, um, some of the partners, again, uh, at the risk of being maybe somewhat repetitive, and then highlight key findings. And then we will have our guests uh, give uh, uh, short um, notes, and we'll start taking the questions from the press. We would like to finish this at 2.25 sharp because we are going to have the public event starting at 2.30, and we want to make sure that we, we transition into the new meeting uh, smoothly. So uh, with this uh, hopefully being uh, clear, uh, let's start with the slides. All of you should be seeing the slide entitled Anti-LGBTQ hate crimes in Miami. Can somebody can give me a thumbs up if that's the case? Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, study focus and uh, partners. Um, the focus of this research has been on anti-LGBTQ hate crimes in the Latino, Latina uh, population. So, Interesting thing as we're presenting some of this research to the community members, community members told us to use the term Latine. A lot of people have uh, negative uh, responses to the term, but uh, uh, there is a sizable population, especially in the young generation that define themselves as gender non-binary or gender non-conforming. And they view that it's a sign of respect if we were to use this term. I don't endorse or uh, I don't have a, the one way or another strong opinion about the term, but this is the language that we have incorporated throughout our reports. So focus is on the Latina LGBTQ population. And um, we uh, have worked with the SAFE, FIU LGBTQA initiative, Survivors Pathways, Pride Line, and a number of other agencies from the community side. Our government partners are the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office and the Police Department. Funding was received from the National Institute of Justice uh, in the amount of $500,000. So, data sources. The primary data source for this research is LGBTQ in-person interviews. We have screened 875 individuals at LGBTQ venues and events and we have recruited 400 participants over the course of the um, 15 months period if they met five selection criteria. They need to be an adult um, because interviewing children poses a lot of ethical challenges that we are not able to overcome. They need to be residents. As you know, Miami is a favorite place for many people, including LGBTQ uh, individuals from around the globe, but we wanted to focus on only local residents uh, uh, it, uh, individual has to be a, a Latino, Latina, Latina, as I mentioned, and uh, must have identified themselves as LGBTQ or gender nonconforming. And they needed to have experienced what they viewed as victimization in prior five years 
and whether that constitutes crime or not is uh, irrelevant in the sense that we are looking into their willingness to report the crime. So if they viewed something was an offense, we wanted them to report the crime. So that was the main data source. The second data source is prosecutorial case file reviews. The state attorney's office gave us unprecedented access to the case files. We went all the way through mid-2019, and we have identified 23 hate crimes disposed by the state attorney's office in 2005-2019, mid-2019. Uh, we know that since then, the focus on the hate crimes has grown. And there are, as far as I know, the, in 2020, we had a couple of dozen hate crimes that either were disposed of or are currently being processed by the state attorney's office. But if we look at 23 uh, cases that we have reviewed, don't forget for the purposes of the research case needed to be disposed of for us to be able to review the case uh, and not to compromise on the, uh, on the, the investigation of the, on the case. So out of 23 cases, 11 included the crimes motivated by victims' sexual orientation. And the last slide, uh, last uh, data source is the prosecutorial uh, and uh, police detective as well as victim specialist interviews. We wanted to hear from the practitioners about their um, uh, views, um, what uh, uh, under reporting looks like, what prevents crime reporting, what are the challenges and how to overcome those challenges. Sometimes hearing from these people is very helpful, especially as we're willing to shape policy recommendations for this work. So with that, I would like to move to the key findings uh, everyone can see the slide called key findings right now, I'm assuming. Um, here, I will only summarize the key findings as they pertain to the interviews of the LGBTQ uh, victims. There are additional findings for every data source. We have two reports, summary report and the technical report. I encourage you to take a look, uh, reach out to any of us if you have any questions. But these are the key findings associated with the interviews. The first finding is 48% of screened respondents experienced victimization in prior five years. 95% of victims reported being victimized because of their LGBTQ identity. 30% of victimized respondents experienced physical or sexual assault. 15% of incidents, which is 60 out of 400, were reported to the police. And if we are to look only into violent and property crimes, it was 45% of uh, uh, incidents reported to the police. So a lot of uh, uh, verbal assaults uh, didn't become reported. And later uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the presentation uh, at the conference uh, in about half hour, we'll explain uh, what that looks like. So 35% 30, of reported incidents, which is 21 out of 60 incidents that were reported resulted in arrest, and 23% of reported incidents resulted in prosecution, but not necessarily as a hate crime because some of these individuals were not comfortable talking about their sexual orientation or gender identity. But uh, uh, even if it was not prosecuted as a hate crime, there was the re response to the uh, underlying crime, whether it was the assault, robbery, burglary, et cetera. And, uh, uh, we, uh, we worked very closely with our partners from law enforcement as a community groups to make sense of the findings, to come up with the policy recommendations. Later, we'll talk about what some of the policy recommendations are and what uh, uh, state attorney's office is already doing in response to the findings. Uh, but here, I'd like to pause and turn it to the state attorney for, uh, for her remarks. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kuta Tegazzi. Um, I really want to let everyone who's listening know how grateful we are as an office to have been allowed to have partnered uh, with FIU and Professor Brasiki, we're going to call him fondly from now on. And of course, with my, my great partner over there, Director uh, Freddie Ramirez from the Metro Day Police Department, and of course, Sage, who's always been a good partner of ours, uh, represented here today by Orlando Gonzalez. Um, this was such an important project. This was such an incredible research project that took a lot of courage and determination to one, undertake to do, and secondly, to actually have found so many uh, participants 
who like the director will tell you and, and the wonderful folks in my office will tell you, and we rarely get to see. And so this has been so helpful and so useful moving forward. Unfortunately, in many respects, it does, um, it does confirm our fears um, that this kind of, these hate crimes, particularly with the LGBTQ community, go underreported, that there's far more crime that's happening to them and involving them than we're getting to see in the law enforcement field, which means they're not getting access necessarily to services. They're not getting access to justice in any way. And that they continue to be victimized. Clearly, if you if you look at some of the statistics, you know there are more than 21 million people in the state of Florida, and over around 100 million tourists coming and going all the time. And yet, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement only reported for 2018 141 reported incidents, and in 2017 145, about the same. And then you really see a drop down in 2016 to 96 and then in 2015-72. So clearly this research project in reaching out and finding um, this unfortunate reality that there are, there are a lot of victims that are living uh, with this tragic situation, this trauma that had occurred to them, and yet we're not able to access us for a whole bunch of psychological and physical and emotional reasons. And, and the findings that you have in this report are going to be useful tools, not only in, in, in you know, actually undermining and emphasizing the underreportedness of it, but it's going to make us be better. It's going to make us in law enforcement um, understand what we have to do in, in different ways, in more aggressive ways, in more sensitive ways and more reassuring ways. And I know the director and the other 34 police departments in Miami-Dade County, once they are aware of this, they too will want to jump in and be part of this awareness campaign that we are going to be launching. Um, we also, as our office, there is a lot more things that we can do and it starts with something called safe space. And one of the things we want uh, people that come to our office, victims that interact with our victim advocates and interact with our office, we want them to know that there's a safe space here for them. And, and just to show, I want to share with our media friends, um, I don't know if you can see this, this is a, an example of uh, signs that we're going to have up in different parts of our office where victims come to our office. They seek justice. They seek services, they seek understanding, and we want them to know that they can be safe and this is a place where they can come and report hate crimes too. I just yeah, yeah, to it's, 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 I put it out there, everyone should be able to see that sign, report hate crime sign on okay. your main screen right now. And, and last, I, 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 you know, I want to turn it over to our other partners, Professor, but I do want to just everyone to please take note and our media friends there, to get this hate crimes unit number out there, the 786-687 number 2566, so that people in our community know that they can count on us. Thank you so much, State Attorney. Uh, we will uh, switch to you, uh, Director, if you have your remarks, please. Yes, good afternoon. First and foremost, it's an absolute honor to represent the Miami-Dade Police Department to be part of this very important study. I truly feel that a community will only feel safe if that everyone is involved, that they all feel that they can reach, that justice can reach them. And it's very important that we modify how we do our, we progress with our policing so that we can address everybody's needs. And I'd like to thank you, sir, with an FIU for letting us be part of this study. Uh, Kathy Rundle for being a great partner in our criminal justice system here in Miami-Dade County and SAVE and all the other groups that are involved. Um, you know, uh, and when we looked at this study, you know, when, as police officers, we figure out ways how to stop crime and how to solve crimes. But sometimes it's very important that we partner up with a university so we can do a true analytical study to really come up with the proper results so that we can address everybody's needs. And that's what's where trust comes in because 
If you look at the world today, the number one thing people look for is trust, not only with government, but with law enforcement, with anything. And I think by doing these partnerships, working together, breaking down the barriers and being honest with ourselves, we can build that trust and move forward and have an even safer society. I'm very proud of this county. I'm proud of this community. I'm proud of all the stakeholders that are involved and how we're all committed for everyone who lives in this community. And, uh, and I think that this is a great platform to, to bring safety and a sense of calm to our community. And I look forward to being part of this and coming up with solutions and really setting the example for the country and the world on how to address this. And, you know, ourselves, we've made already some proactive measures. We put it on our website, awareness. Um, you know, we're reporting it in our annual report. We're in the process of creating signage as well through, the, through our county communications uh, office so we could put this out through our police station through our government facility so we could show that awareness so people are not afraid to come forward and, and advise it when they've been victimized because that is our job is to keep everyone safe and to bring justice and uh as i said earlier i look forward to being part of this group and we're committed all the way thank you so much thank you director thank you very much for your partnership uh orlando we'll switch to you now Absolutely. Uh, Professor Basiki, th thank you so much for doing the work, for conducting the research, and a big thanks to the partners as well, of course, uh, Kathy Fernandez-Rendell, the state attorney, and uh, the Miami-Dade Police Department. We really appreciate uh, the level of coordination and willingness to, to do this. I think in many ways, you know, we were sort of ex exposing our wards, but there was a lot of willingness to say we've got to do this in order to make improvements, so really appreciate that. Um, SAVE's role was to provide guidance into the LGBT community and also to introduce uh, the research team to some of the other LGBT stakeholders. And so we were really proud to be able to do that. Uh, like uh, Director Ramita said, uh, it is so critical that we now have data to be able to use to, to do what uh, the city attorney said earlier, right? So our biggest fears are being revealed, uh, but we needed to see the data in order to know what we were going to dig into. <clears throat> For myself, you know, when I started to look at uh, report, I started to think about uh, the mid to early or the early to mid 1990s when we were digging into uh, sexual assault and rape, which was when we discovered that there's a lot of underreporting. Uh, but when you dig deeper, I think that when you think about underreporting, it's not just about the victim reporting. It's not that simple. I think that what we're seeing here through the research is that it's complex. It's about what, <clears throat> what exists in the general environment, right? What's the responsibility? that the victim has, the friends of the victim that are with them, uh, the institutions that surround the individuals, law enforcement, the general community's attitude towards uh, hate crimes and assault. And so everybody has a role here. I think that's what the data is showing us, that, that there's many um, implications for people to make improvements to be able to really um, uh, improve how we uh, handle hate crimes. I think that there's a lot of societal pressures and shame that takes place that prevents us from really seeing what the real data looks like. But I think that this is one of the first steps uh, for SAVE. Uh, we really embrace these findings and we look forward to working with elected officials, uh, the state attorney's office and law enforcement to be able to more effectively address hate crimes and make improvements. And so for us, there's really three areas of work that we're gonna be doing to follow on uh, from the research findings. And one of them is to identify gaps in the legislation or anywhere there's opportunities to help support ancillary training for law enforcement and the judiciary. Uh, the second is to uh, research and find draft model legislation that can be used to support these efforts. And finally, of course, to pursue the support of other public officials to adopt legislation and training. So that's sort of the three prongs uh, that we look at for SAFE to be able to build on this. And so, uh, as I said before, we appreciate the opportunity, thank all the partners, and we're really grateful to our Champion of Equality, uh, Professor Vasiki. Thank you. <laughs> Arlando, you've been a wonderful pr friend and a colleague here, so we appreciate that. And you know, I must note that it's very rare to see the academic universities uh, partner so closely with law enforcement and then advocacy and service providers to develop a common vision and have the common goal to address the needs of the vulnerable population. So seeing everyone to come together in a heartbeat, literally in a couple of days, and support the proposal that we put together to the Department of Justice was in astonishing to me, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and so, Will, um, thank you for the remarks. So we are in a position right now to spend the next few minutes taking the questions, if there are any questions from the media. 
So you can probably uh, unmute yourself now uh, if you have any question, um, introduce yourself and uh, ask the question. So, um, you know, I can start with a couple of questions and I have obviously many, many questions. And I'd like to ask the state attorney, if, you know, uh, what was about the findings that still surprised you that you didn't expect to see? And, or made you think about the issues that you thought were, was so familiar to you differently? I think that there were a number of findings, Professor, that are, were very outstanding for all of us. And I would say one of the first ones was the volume, the sheer number uh, that you found uh, that, you know, I think the rest of us in law enforcement, we knew it was underreported. We feared that it was uh, very similar to what Orlando talked about, like we've seen in other vulnerable victim populations like rape victims mm -hmm. or domestic violence cases. But the sheer number that you were able to find and where they said 95% of it was because of their sexual identity. I mean, that was just heartbreaking when you think about it. And then to understand uh, some of their fears was another finding. Now, what, what is the under root causes of their reluctance to come forward, to want to talk about what happened to them and why it happened to them? And are they, you know, in understanding that oftentimes it's because they don't have family members that may know yet, and they don't want to go through that trauma. Um, some of the shame that they may feel, like some of our other victims, when we know that there's nothing to do with them, the one that should have shame is the perpetrator, the one who's committing these hate crimes. That's the one who should be ashamed. And so looking at all those factors, the other thing is just useful tools that you, your research project found for all of us, you know, how we ask questions, how we desperately need to become an enlightened and a very aware community about hate crimes and their pervasiveness and how it's going to take all of us to create an environment. You might call it a task force, but it's going to take all of us. It's going to take those of us in law enforcement. It's going to take those of us in the service providing a service provider, non for profit world. We're all going to have to create a safety net of services um, for these victims, one, to find them, and then to also direct them into services while we show them a pathway to justice that they can trust. And so it was just so helpful, not just on an awareness basis, but also very useful tools. You know, just creating a safe house concept for our office, for the police departments. That's a huge step forward. So those are just some of the many things that I think I know I am very grateful to, uh, to you, uh, Professor, and your team and, and, and the National Institute of Justice that funded this and thought it was important. And I know you're not bragging about it, but my understanding is that this is a one of its kind a research project in the United States of America. And it happened here with your leadership in our community and we're very grateful to be part of that. Thank you so much for that. No, we, we have a number of prosecutors are asking about this already from other jurisdictions. There have been studies done on hate crimes, but main focus has been more on uh, religiously motivated hate crimes or maybe racially motivated hate crimes. But there are also very few studies that led from research findings into policy recommendations into something that's tangible and involved the community stakeholders and government stakeholders to come together to articulate, so what now? We have the findings. So that was incredible stuff. Um, and you know, it was, it was sad to be hearing the stories of these victims. And one of the regrets I have about this research that we report the numbers, but the numbers don't tell you the full story. You know, some of the stories, you know, if you are a victim of a crime, what would you do? You would go back to your family to seek support and love and care. But for many of these people, that's not an option. In fact, sometimes the family members are the ones who are perpetrators. So, uh, so the sense of helplessness and 
the value of one's dignity and life is just comes up in those conversations over and over again. And with reporting, you are law enforcement professionals, you know, reporting any crime, especially assault and sexual assault is very hard. If that involves um, revealing one's sexual orientation, that's so much harder. That involves being an immigrant because you may have had such bad experiences with law enforcement from your own countries that you bring that vision to you, to Miami, that's much harder. And now add to this, if the perpetrator is your family member or a community member. And so all those additional barriers uh, and another angle can be the immigration status, right? All of those add additional layers that created those obstacles. And that's something that we're hoping to, the study has scratched the surface of, but um, you understand exactly what I'm explaining. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, director, we'll come uh, uh, to you uh, for, for your, uh, if you have any thoughts about uh, uh, some of the findings that may have surprised or if you want to make an additional comment about what are the specific things that the agency may do to increase the awareness on this issue and make people comfortable to come forward and express oneself. Well, first of all, I agree with everything that, that Ms. Rundle said. She's absolutely right. In fact, she's a trailblazer on on the crimes that occur in the shadows, domestic violence, uh, sexual abuse, human trafficking, those are things that she, she leads on. And that's how we've evolved to investigate these things. And as I sit back and listen, I'm actually very excited because we have a foundation here through our victim advocates that the state attorney was a champion about that. Now we have them throughout the whole, our whole investigative component, our media awareness, the pamphlets, the healthcare providers that we work with. All that is here. We, now what we can do is not just focus on DV or uh, sexual crime. Let's build the whole scope of our society so that we can treat everyone and they can feel the same way that they feel justice, that they could feel comfortable coming forward with the established processes that we have in place. So we just have to adjust to ensure that we capture everyone and they feel the trust to come to us and they, we ourselves work and understand and uh, I think, I think that, that uh, this study provides an avenue for us to really make a lot of progress with this, and I, I'm excited. I think it's great. Director, thank you very much for your vision, for your support. Um, uh, we will uh, let you go now. I know you have another commitment. We will have to wrap this up. We have an, another public event in two minutes. Kathy, you want one last comment? Yes, thank you, Professor. Please indulge me just a minute. I just have... Tengo un mensaje muy importante para los que hablan español por, porque el mensaje de todos nosotros es víctimas. Aquí, aquí hay un espacio seguro. Por favor, reportando. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone.